Let's go. What's popping, people? My friends, my family, my revolutionary blackout family. Super hyped. My adrenaline stills up. So, <laughs> a lot of you guys who've been following the channel know I've been fishing for a debate for quite some time. <laughs> I finally got my fight. I finally got the fight that we were looking for, guys. <laughs> From Destiny, of all people, too. So I, I do want to say, I do want to say, I do give props for Destiny for taking this debate. Because <laughs> not a lot of people is one want that heat. Not a lot of people want that funk. Now, to be fair, Destiny is so big, you probably didn't know who the fuck I was. <laughs> so we debated two hours ago. Um, I fucked up because I was supposed to record the Zoom meeting and then post it. But I think this is better. Because now I'm gonna just we're gonna just watch the debate uh together. Um it's hap I'm gonna show you guys the replay. We debated literally two hours ago, two hours ago, and you guys can see by my mood, I think it went pretty well. I probably I probably shouldn't spoil it. I don't want any spoiler alerts, but I do I, I let me say it, let me explain to you guys how this happened. Oh shit, where it go? Where it go? Oh, here's the background. Cause this happened all today, it happened out of nowhere. Um Yo, yeah, I'm a. Uh, we gonna watch the the debate. Hopefully, yeah, Destiny still got the stream up. He's still live. Jesus fuck, Destiny do not play around, man. Um, here's how everything started. Cause you guys know my ass is is online. Um, oh shit, I spoiled it. <laughs> so uh, here's Destiny. Um, I de I decided to get into this because I saw he was trying. He was ratioing a mutual of mine, so I, I had to jump in. And Destiny was saying, what is the history of fascism in the UK or the USA? What's the history of fascism? Huh? So <laughs> I feel like I had to do some educating, which I did. And I posted this. Did I get the ratio? Oh, we're so close. We're so close. Not bad considering we only um, a few likes away, considering I posted afterwards. So like... The idea that the United States is not a fascist country is hilarious to me. <laughs> it's beyond hilarious. I'll post this. Um, let's see what, what they will say about this. I just want to find Destiny's reply. Oh, Jesus. There he is. So this is where I was like, bro, no way. <laughs> he was like, want to DM me and hop on stream and chat about it? Send the link, man. <laughs> so, let's watch the replay of the debate. And, Chad, what do you guys think? Like, I think I'm, I may commentate on it, but I, I, I think it's better for you guys, like, viewer-wise, to just listen to it. I also don't think D Destiny will have any problem with me uh, airing the debate on the channel. He said I can live stream it, but I fucked up. I forgot <laughs> to do it. I'm so pissed. And I'm also pissed because there were like five thousand people watching this because Destiny's huge. And my, I think I plugged my, I think I plugged Revolutionary Blackout in the beginning, but then I forgot, <laughs> I forgot that uh, to plug at the end. So man, I fucked up. <laughs> I fucked up. So uh, here, let's let's dive into the video. Um, so yeah, I see some people say one comment. I'm gonna I'm gonna let the debate run for quite a long time. Like if I do comment. I will comment maybe after like 10 minutes or so. I don't want to, I'm not going to interrupt it many times. If I do interrupt it, I may just uh, jump in to clarify a point. But I don't, I think the debate speaks for itself. So once again, I do want to give props to Destiny. Like no one else would debate me. <laughs> like, so I do think Destiny um, just didn't know who I was. And the reason why he responded to me, because a lot of people, it's ratio on him on Twitter. But, like, ever since, like, recently, my followers have been insane. I got 76,000 followers on Twitter now. I gained, like, 10,000 followers in, like, a month, guys. It's crazy. So I think he just saw a guy with a higher follower count. He decided to debate that guy because everyone on the left is attacking him for this positioning. But he saw I had a, uh, had a big following count, and I kind of sicked the dogs on him because I saw him going after – one of my mutuals. I'm like, bro, we follow each other. You got the protection of 
You got the protection of revolutionary blackout if you're a friend on Twitter. <laughs> it's just that simple. I saw my friend uh, Laura going after him. So I was like, bro, let me chime in. I wasn't even expecting the debate, but he's a big debate me, bro. So he challenged me, and um, I feel good about it. So I, I think I'm going to shut up now. I think I'll preface this enough. Uh, let me fix my audio, and then we play the debate. And let me share. Here, there we go. Take me off the screen because you guys only see me. I don't think. have shifted significantly to the left since then. Um, I like to consider myself more of a socialist uh, now, uh, even to the left of Bernie Sanders' squad. So yeah, that's the only thing I had to say to start us off. Um, anything you want to add? <laughs> and you can like introduce the conversation, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, my online handle is fucking Destiny because I play video games. Um, but yeah, I'm Steve Bunnell. I do a lot of politics stuff. Um, I consider myself to be pretty far left leaning, but not quite a socialist or anything like that. Um, and yeah, I guess we are having a disagreement on Twitter about whether the United States is a fascist country. And I think more broadly speaking, like, what does it mean to say something is a fascist dest uh, uh, fascist country or something? Um, yeah, so there are a lot of ways you can take this out it depends on how you want to define fascism there are a lot of different people with with varying opinions uh i i sh i quoted the 14 mm -hmm. uh, steps to fascism obviously there are a lot of people who talk about fascism as being a merging of corporation and state um, of a collection of dictatorial power mm -hmm. and authoritarianism um and when i look at the 14 steps and everything that fascism is is defined as my reaction is the U.S. is fascist or worse. Like when you look at the human death count, when you look at the rights that they steal, when you look at the overall death count, the way the the fight and struggle that they wage against workers, and the fact that the rich control everything, I think like whether you want to define it as fascism, I don't think that's that important. But to pretend that the United States as an empire has the more high ground over anyone. I think it's kind of foolish. So that's, I guess I'll start there. Sure. So my issue, I guess, is that like, I feel like when we, I think we both can agree that the United States has problems. What I don't like is the labeling of every problem as fascist, because I think it just, it instantaneously derails the conversation and gets us into really weird like dick measuring areas where it's like, did the US kill more people than Germany? Or like, are we too much this or too much that? Like, why can't we just address what the problems are instead of hyper fixating on so, calling so things we, fascist? I don't think we're going to be yelling at each other as, as much as many people think we, we will, because I actually kind of agree with that. My point is, if you're going to label any modern country fascist, the United States will, will be fascist. We well, live in. I mean, like, so if we want to go like further into that, like when we talk about like the 14 points, these things mean pretty pretty strict things and i feel like if we take them and we bend them then like basically every single western country would be considered fascist yeah that's that's why i actually kind of agree with your initial point where you say it's, it's not too important to label uh, anything as like fascist or whatever i think it's more important to talk about the harm that is caused but when i look at the definition of fascism when i look at all the states that we have at least all the prominent states in the developed world i think the united states is the closest that we had to fascists well, I mean, like, yeah. I think Russia would fit way more easily, no? How? Well, you can't explain that? Um, sure. So, like, if we were to walk down a list of the 14 points, um, so, like, number one, like, powerful and continuing nationalism. Like, the, I, I think that Putin's statements in regards to Ukraine, one of the justifications given is that, like, we need to reunite our peoples, that Russia has, like, this obligation you know, to people in other countries, and it's part of their like rebuilding of an empire, their pride as a nation. Like, I, I feel like, I feel like Russia is a highly nationalistic country, and I think Putin leans into it probably more so than we do in the United States. But I mean, we have to accept that every country, to some extent, is going to have some level of nationalism because, like, I mean, like French people are probably proud to be part of France, Germany. Yeah. And and I I, I don't I wish there was another option that Russia had in Ukraine. But when you look at the United States, 800 military bases surrounding Russia, 
So once, I am not here defending states. I don't care about Russia as a state. I think I don't, I don't like Putin because he's an anti-communist. But if you want to call Russia a fascist country, or, or at least like allude to that, I'm not here to straw man your arguments at all. Yeah. You should at least admit that if, if you think the Russia is fascist, you must believe the United States is fascist. If you don't think that is, I would love, I, I'm, I'm just interested in hearing that. Yeah, I just, I don't ever see the United States saying things like, we are going to go and like support civil wars in places to defend like our ethnic people in other areas, which is one of the claims that Russia's made. That's like a pretty fashy thing to say. Like these are ethnic that's brothers. A unique, uh -huh. That's a unique. That's a unique statement. Um, I'm trying to. I think it's the Monroe Doctrine, right? The idea that the United States put out that anything in their uh, anything in the Western Hemisphere is their backyard. How is that ideology any different than what Russia is doing in Ukraine? Um, I mean, like we can talk about. The, so when well, they I, like, so it, hold on, I, my history is not. How many people was hurt in Cuba because the United States believed they owned the sovereignty of that country? I, I think when we talk about like the Monroe Doctrine, we're this is a way different time in history. Like in terms of like European we, countries, we are, still believe it. What? We still believe in it though. We just we you. But the problem that you have a lot of like, I, actually I, I don't. I'm not mm -hmm. trying to be mean, but like no, you go for it. Liberals, liberal. I'm not. I don't. That's not my intention here. So mm -hmm. they pretend that all the sins of the United States is in the past. But they believe they still believe in the Monroe Doctrine. They just repackage it, right? Yeah, but the the way that we like, I'm pretty sure that like the way that we practice the Monroe Doctrine now is is not like we're gonna go and start wars in every single country. Like since the 90s yeah, we on, starve them. what we starve them. Yeah. Well, I, I, I mean, I, well, the U.S. is like maybe the biggest like country. We might do more foreign aid than any other country in the world. I think like we are starving millions of Afghanistan people right now. We funding genocide in Yemen. We just well, we left Afghanistan, right? Yeah, so we started. We started starving. I I don't differentiate. Mm -hmm. There's no difference to me between hot war and cold war. That's why I didn't praise Biden for pulling out Afghanistan because it's clear they have plans for them. So you, there's a story that just came out maybe a few weeks ago that showed that Russia. Sorry, not Russia. Sorry, mm -hmm. Afghanistan. More people are going to die in Afghanistan because of sanction. So because of Biden freezing funds, to be more accurate, than they did during the war, two decades. Literally, thirteen thousand infants have died because they cannot. The mothers cannot produce milk because the United States is withholding uh, Afghan funds. They're literally people having their funds stolen. So yeah, they shifted their strategy, but they still believe in the full spectrum dominance. The dominance. Well, but do we like does if you if your country that's ran by the Taliban is having problems feeding the people? Whatever, does the United States have like an obligation then to help? Because here is like a weird game. I don't want to say game. Here's a weird thing that I feel like um, people on the left will say sometimes. They'll say that like when you engage with trade with the United States. Or if you take loans from the IMF, like that's a form of soft imperialism that's being pushed on you. Like now your country is being taken advantage of by the United States. But then in the next breath, they'll say things like the U.S. like refusing to trade with Cuba or the U.S. not trading with or, um, you know, tariffing like countries like Afghanistan. Well, that's actually evil, too. Well, like, which is it? Like, I, like, th like, do you have an obligation as a country to get full access to the United States economy and trade and be a part of it? Or is that like a form of imperialism that like works out poorly for every country? Yeah, well, according to Lenin, imperialism is an economic order, and that's why NATO must be opposed because it's all about maintaining this economic order. Now we go more into like that particular story with Russia and Ukraine. It's all about funneling arms. It's all about getting money to shady oligarchs. So when I see the economic order that the United States has imposed on the world, I see that as a net, neg net, net negative when you look at the life expectancy and the results of that in the global South. Hell, even in our own communities, like we our quality of life is dropping because the United States is spending so much money on empire. And if you look at the 14 steps of fascism, a, hev a heavily militaristic country, and I don't think this is necessarily on the 14 steps, but I think a lot of people will agree, like a country that neglects its own people in order to bomb and starve other people in other countries. Once again, I don't know if you want to call that fascist, but it's not anything better. I guess it's like, let's say that I can identify some set, we probably would agree that there are some set of problems that we can identify um, either within the United States or within the global West or within some of these larger, you know, international structures or supranational structures like the EU or NATO or whatever. Um, I, I feel like that the conversations would be so much more productive if we just said things like, hey, let's focus on trade policy in the United States. Uh, like I think Biden was in talks of like unfreezing some of the Afghan central bank funds in order to use them for humanitarian purposes. Like, I think that like, these are good conversations to have, but when we make the conversation about how like, 
I, you might do this. I don't know if you do, but I, I just, I'm not familiar with, with your activity. But like when it seems like a lot of people's entire political ideologies are defined by the phrase US bad. Like in everything, it's, it's just basically being infinitely critical of the United States. And it's like, well, why not find like here, like the United States has a lot of good around the world. Uh, like there's a lot of people in Africa that like, what? Not for black and brown people. Absolutely. There's a lot of people in Africa whose favorite president is literally George W. Bush because of the unbelievable contributions to HIV research and stuff and HIV drugs that um, the United States did in a lot of African countries that were really poor and couldn't afford them. So I'm not, I'm not saying the U.S. is perfect. Oh, there are ongoing genocides in Africa that the United States won't take a position. That's bad, right? So, I mean, like, I'm not saying that the U.S. is perfect, of course, and the U.S. definitely contributes to it, maybe even causes problems in areas for sure. But like, why not? Why can't we have a more granular view of like, okay, the U.S. does some good things here. We can do more good here, like sending vaccines to other countries around the world that can't afford it. And the U.S. does some bad things here. Let's focus on the bad things here, rather than being like the United States is a fascist country, the worst country. They do more bad than anything. Mm -hmm. We have to be intense in our rhetoric because they are intense in their propaganda. Like people who believe this country is what it's not. Like people still believe we have a Bill of Rights. Like people still believe we have a First Amendment. People still believe we have a second amendment. People think we have a fourth amendment. People, we, we don't have these amendments. They they took these, at least in my community, like there are people more privileged who got these who got these rights. So when you're dealing with US propaganda, who like throughout my entire life and throughout the world, like I think they propagandized uh, those African people that you were talking about because I would love to explain the crimes of the United States and NATO and AFRICOM and what they did to Africa. And you see the world fall for this during the Iraq invasion where they all fell for George W. Bush's lie because the United States propaganda is the most complex propaganda system in the world. So we don't have time to mix, mix words. So I'd rather, I'd rather, if the United States want to call other countries fascist, I'm going to call you fascist. I'm going to tell, I'm going to explain people why, because we got to cut through the, we got to cut through the, the, the chief for lack of a better analogy, right? Yeah. But so, I mean, like, then what do we, um, what, like, it seems like if I look at the state of, would you consider yourself like a progressive or um you can call me a socialist communist i don't get like 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 just like y'all don't get too obsessed with labels but i find myself mm -hmm. sympathizing with a lot of communists let's just say that yeah i'm just saying it like it seems like if i look at the state of progressives in the united states it feels like progressives are losing ground everywhere yes. and when i see like who is gaining ground it seems to be more people that are aiming towards the middle so for instance i know everybody hates mansion but he he gained more popularity than any other senator in the united states in terms of approval so if, if our goal is to advance a progressive agenda, if we want to bring more awareness to ways that the United States might subvert the rights of, especially minority communities, especially impoverished minority communities, going more and more extreme just seems like we're losing a lot of people in the middle that might otherwise support a cause. You know, like, I feel like I feel like I could get, well, I, I do, because I, I talk to a lot of people. I do, I do like debates and conversations. If I talk to like a person in the center and I'm like, hey, like your wealth comes a lot from your family, right? Like, yeah, of course. A lot of your family's wealth is like tied up in their home and stuff, right? Yeah, of course. Don't you think it's a little bit shitty that like there were banks that, you know, not even, you know, 60, 70 years ago would basically say like, you are black, so you can't buy a house here. Couldn't that pretty easily like trickle down and screw over people in the United States today? Yeah, I think so. I think that's reasonable. I think I could get almost everybody to agree with that. But if I come out hard and I'm like, did you know that the United States is a white supremacist country that's hell bent on the suppression and oppression of minorities? And that if you don't agree with me, you're actually a fascist. Like at that point, I've lost everybody. Like I, the, the conversation is over because most people are just going to tune out, right? I, I used to give speeches to black bar in black barbershops. I talked to black people in South Carolina, mm -hmm. the most conservative people that you can talk to. Mm -hmm. And you are right in a way. You got to know your audience. Like when I'm on my YouTube channel, when I'm on Twitter, I'm more, I'm trying to elicit thought. Like when you bring these things up and this is the success I found in my very, very short time of doing this, you elicit the thought. But every every provocative thing I say, I can back up, right? So I put these things out there so, to mm -hmm. get people to think. And then when they ask, once they start asking questions, mm -hmm. then I explain, right? So you brought up how uh, the Democratic Party it has more success in the center and the right. And people like Joe Manchin had more success. And this is why I would say the United States, uh, once again, I don't even like using the term fascist, but this is it's closer than anyone else because we are a dictatorship. Mm -hmm. Like fascism is, de is defined by a dictatorship. We live in a dictatorship of capital. So when you have progressives who I think are fraudulent, like that's a whole nother conversation. When you look at LC, Bernie Sanders, the squad, mm -hmm. their only role is to sheepdog people into a right-wing party. They're not here to, to establish revolutionary spirit and revolutionary thought. That is how we gain power as leftists and have workers, believing in mutual aid, doing strikes, 
not engaging in the rigged inside game. We need outside power. AOC, Bernie Sanders, they do not engage in that. Bernie Sanders had the, probably the largest email list in political history. Maybe low, may, I think more than Trump, right? Maybe Trump had more, I don't know. But probably one of the most impressive email lists and donor lists of all time. What did Bernie Sanders do with that? When Did he use that email list to challenge the Democratic Party, challenge the corporate state and police state that we live in now? No, they did not. They don't wield their power the way they're supposed to. That's why Joe Manchin gets gains because the centrists in the party, their job is to win. Now, I do want to circle back. I know I'm, mm-hmm. I'm again low. But when you look at one of the reasons why centrists and the right hand dominate, it had nothing to do with rhetoric. That's why progressive policies, that's why, hell, you, you can even call them socialist policies are massively popular. But we live in a dictatorship where capital defines what you, we get in our government, not the people. And the most recent example is Roe v. Wade. Like 70% of the country supports keeping Roe v. Wade, but we got to lose Roe v. Wade because under capitalism, we do not have a democracy. It's literally based well, on whatever. But I mean, like, so th- this is my problem when, when we like, when you seed, when you give up the political ground, you've essentially removed yourself from the system with which you can enact change. And realistically, for whatever we want to think, like, there's probably not going to be a violent revolution in our lifetimes in the United States that's going to upend the government and and, put, and install something better, right? There might, maybe there will be a violent that's revolution. Okay, but yeah. but that's, not, that's not an accurate prediction. On you. I have a hard time seeing it. I just think that it, I, I do think that's the only way we're going to have change, but uh, to your, I think your prediction is not too far off, to be honest. Yeah, but, but I mean, but when we say that, when we remove people from the ability to participate in their in their political system because they think that their participation means nothing, you're empowering the other side so much more. I understand. You misunderstand. Mm-hmm. And maybe that's my fault. Sure, that's fine. Properly. So um, I think my politics is actually the most empowering form of politics. Like, I don't, I don't know how much you know. I, I just know a little bit about you. But mm-hmm. like, when you look at Bernie Sanders, AOC and the movement, they killed a lot of progressive spirit. A lot of people are demoralized seeing uh, Bernie Sanders run a horrific campaign the second time, essentially become a Biden bro now. And there's a level of defeatism, especially after Super Tuesday, where we're like, oh, my God, we can't do it. Oh my God, we can't take over the Democratic Party because it's run by corporate donors. So this is well, actually maybe more- maybe it's just because progressive policies aren't as popular as progressives think they are. Like, could uh, that be when possible? You people, when you actually talk to people, you realize that's ridiculous. Like, not only they're polls, but when you actually talk to people, I, I live in a red state. I live in Kansas City. I work in Kansas. So cars. You talk to the most redneck person, and they will agree to you that it, that that they should have health care. That the minimum wage should increase. In Missouri, we literally have a ballot initiative that increased the minimum wage. We literally have a ballot initiative that uh, that approved medical marijuana and mm-hmm. expanded Medicaid. And this is in a red state. In the Wait, but in Missouri, that one did that one pass? The uh, minimum but, wage mm-hmm. did yes. But and, that, wait, wait, what in Missouri wasn't that for twelve an hour though, not fifteen? My yes, but that's, yeah, 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 because that was, whenever the American people are asked, they mm-hmm. vote to increase wages. Well, but like now, that's you, that was the thing. Like when we were taught, when we had that national discourse on minimum wage, um, Manchin said he would support twelve an hour, but everybody wanted to push for fifteen. But Manchin, no, Manchin was just there to be just like, and that worked for him because, as you say, he's doing well politically in in this area because I think the propaganda in this country is intense, but Manchin, like, even throughout the Build Back Better program and everything, every time he asks something, he's just there to be the disruptor. Like, Well, he represents, like, the center point of the Democratic Party, right? Well, I think you give him too much benefit of doubt. I think he's working on behalf of the donors. When you look at Sanders, when you look at the people on the top, especially Manchin, considering his uh, connection with Cole and a lot of different uh, corrupt Wall Street connections he had with his family. We can, I mean, we, he, he's not he's not there representing like oh I I just got a I just got a substantive disagreement with Bernie Sanders. But he no, but, he's why, not but that's there. it could he's be there. it could be he's possible. There. Like he he's really popular with he's really popular with voters, right? Like yeah, because we are we are extremely propagandized. But now and then you also got a member of the people who don't vote. Like I don't know the numbers in West Virginia, but I would love to I would love to look it up if there's anything like national averages. You have about 40, 50 percent of people who vote. We are the one of the worst in the developing country. What does that tell? What does that say to you about how people feel about the politicians and how they represent them? Like if people feel like the politicians will actually represent them, we will have a t- vote turnout as high as France. I don't don't quote me, but I think it's like 75. Oh, actually, maybe I should Google if I say it. But France election participation is insane. And that's the same with a lot of other Western countries. The reason why a lot of people don't engage in politics in this country because they know it's not worth a damn. But, it, but you, I mean, it, it would be, right? P- you can vote people out of office like it happens, no? Even if you vote Joe Manchin, there was a story that, that came out that there was like 10 to 15 Democrats that was happy that Joe Manchin is, existed. Because if it went for Joe Manchin, then they would have to oppose the bill. Because if, if they know the bill is going to stop anyway, 
it doesn't make any sense for them to put their name out on the line. You see how much. Yeah, of course. But like the reason why they have to oppose the bill is because their constituents don't want it. Right. Like at the end of the day, like these senators. Are... You don't. So that, that's, something that, that's just something we, do, we have to disagree with because I don't think it works that way. Uh, obviously, they get money from donors and they are class loyal. Yeah, but who are the donors, right? We're, Trump and Bernie Sanders raised the majority of their money off of small donors, right? Both of these guys did. If, if you look at Manchin, a lot of his friends, a lot of his connections work in the coal industry. I don't know his whole biography, but his daughter invested in the coal mines. Like, there's a class interest, and this is something that Marxism teaches you. Like, if you're a capitalist, you have no idea what's going on. Mm -hmm. But when you're Marxist, everything makes sense. Cla Joe, Joe Manchin is class loyal. He's here to halt all progress by the workers, and he has a media arm that will help sell that message to him to keep him electable. And if Joe Manchin lose, they will just find another person who is class loyal because in order to be a senator, for the very most part, you have to be rich in order to run a statewide campaign. So and then if we, if I'm, if, so let's say that I, let's say that I buy, let's say that I grant all of this. Let's say I believe all of this. And I, so backing off then. So then what is the solution then? Because it sounds like you're saying that like, whoever you vote out, like everything will be messed up. Like the corporate donors choose everybody anyway. Like what is the solution then? I like, so what I say, we need to start doing community organizing. We need to start engaging in mutual aid. Now, this is not a sexy answer mm -hmm. because as I believe the United States is a violent fascist country and the police is continuing to kill more of us and they are uh, waging class war behind on behalf of the ruling class. The only thing we can do is get together and organize community protection. Uh, make sure we take care of ourselves while we fight the struggle, while we get people more class conscious. And then we can literally start shutting stuff down. That's why we did a general strike summit. Well, I was advocating for a general strike. And, and is that possible? There are people who argue like, oh, that's not possible. I'm like, well, that's our only, ch our only chance because capital will only uh, concede through intense um, struggle. And if they see their society start to collapse, if people start getting frustrated, because you only really need about three to 5% of the population to be on board. And then you start shutting shit down. You start getting people on board. Then mm -hmm. people are like, man, things are falling apart because all these workers are striking. You got you got businesses that are closing down. And then you will try to peel people to your side as they see society start to crumble because they're like, well, these people, their ass are not that unreasonable. Like you got these people that are asking for health care. You got, you got these people asking for increased minimum wage. Is it really worth destabilizing our country for this? And my my hypocrisy, my hypothesis. Now this is completely uh, theoretical. Um, I think they will allow the country to crumble before they give up any power. Mm -hmm. Now what happens when a country crumble? You got even more people who are more radicalized, you got more people that are more militant. Now this, there, there are people that may be less doomer than me, may, people who may believe the establishment may concede power, but as we continue to be more militant, more organized as a working class coalition, because there are more of us than them, we can extract concessions until we are ready for the violent revolution. But like here, so like revolution. this is, this is my Go issue ahead. when we talk about this. Well, what concessions can the far left get right now? I don't think they can get any because they're just not that popular. We can we can we can strive to increase the quality of life for everyday people and prevent the violence that black, brown, and colonized people are struggling under right now. So even though we are not going to get Medicare for all, the least we can do is demand the end to ICE detention. We can the least we can do is in, uh, demand the end of massive police funding that is not justified. The least we can do is end the new Jim Crow. The least we can do is support BDS in order to stand in solidarity with our Palestinian brothers and sisters, right? So at this point, as it is right now, the best the left can do, because this is what the left originated as. Like there are a lot of white people who took this over, but the left is a movement that is meant to liberate, colonize people and promote the prosperity of workers. Now this state is so violent, this state is so unhinged, that we must engage um, in, in protection of our people. Now, I know this, sound, this may sound boring to anyone who is like upper class and bourgeoisie, but this system represents you. Like you not, like police is not over policing your community. It's not your community that will have their water poisoned because of companies allowed to poison the water supply. The military poisoned the black community. The Navy poisoned indigenous uh, Hawaiian water supplies. So I know I'm going a little long-winded here, but to answer your question, I think the number one goal of left right now is to secure liberation for the people by by all means necessary. And then once we get there, then we can really start getting gains. We're just so behind, and there's so people don't even understand the problem that we have right now. We are extremely, extremely behind. We can't even get, can't even think about getting concessions until we start fighting for liberation. 
and having Jim Crow Joe, having Joe Biden, the person who built this insanely racist, broken system, like the fact that, like that goes back to my original criticism, the fact that we, we will even back that guy shows how far behind we are. So I, you are right on that. We are, we got a lot of work to do, but it's not, it's not, we're not going to get there by pretending the United States is on our side. Like you're saying, oh, the United States is not a fascist country. The United States is actually a great, a good, that's not going to help our, our fight for liberation. All right. Well, um, yeah, I guess I just, I feel like disengagement with the political system is, is because it's giving so much power. I think people, I think people should, should engage locally. Because I, I co-found Attend Demands, and there have been examples of people decreasing the police budgets and decreasing the power of the police through local politics. Mm -hmm. There have been examples of the Black Panthers helping get people fed, and there are a lot of initiatives that's very similar. My co my uh, colleague and my great friend Rome from Revolutionary Blackout, he hosts Tour for the Poor, where you go around feeding people and educating people on how to become class conscious. So this is not typical political engagement. This is not voting every two years and praying God some guy in the suit going to care about you. Mm -hmm. This is actually something that empowers people because they're like, oh, we have the power. We can take care of each other. But we, there are a lot of people that have been brainwashed by individualism, by capitalism, to, to have everyone compete against each other instead of us coming together at community, community and solving these problems, which I think is the only answer. The idea that you're going to have these people that are funded by billionaires and oligarchs, the people who don't care, they only care about their career and maintaining their career. The idea that we're going to have uh, any sort of gains through relying on these people that benefit from the system, that's an incoherent strategy. And that is evident by the state of this country. Because it's not like I have political power. It's not like I have influence. I'm, I'm sure your audience is multiple, multiple, multiple times larger than mine. I have no influence. We've seen your strategy in play. We've seen the strategy of Bernie Sanders in play. We've seen the strategy of AOC in play. Have that worked? No. Yeah, so but I'm I think the reason, like, I mean, I would say like the reason why it didn't work is there's not enough popular support in the country for it. Like, I think that, I think that progressives fundamentally misunderstand or they feel like if I can just talk to everybody, they'll agree with me. But I think there are real ideological disagreements in the United States that I think we have to like, we have to win those debates. We have to win those arguments and convince people that like, hey, this is the way mm -hmm. forward. And it feels like the battleground sometimes that progressive chooses are like the least popular battlegrounds ever. And it's alienating more and more people away from the Democratic Party or from progressive causes at all. Like that, like that defund the police stuff doesn't work well, even in minority communities. Like, like black families don't want to see police disappear from their communities because they don't want their kids doing crack or being in gang violence, you know, or like brown wait, not true. So there was exit polling. And I'm, and I don't blame you for this because there's been so much propaganda because after the George Floyd protest, the establishment was terrified. So on MSNBC, you see people say stuff like, oh, my God, defund the police is only supported by white people. This is white liberals going too far. But from the very beginning, and this is from 538, and they and the mainstream media never report on this. I can I can send you the, the link to this if you want. Mm -hmm. They polled people on how they believe in defund the police. And that number had, has a lot of work to do when they polled it because it was mostly, um, oh, shit. We only got 10 minutes left. I don't got pro on my Zoom. Oh, but they okay. found that even when defund the police was at its most unpopular, it was supported by black people at around the 60 percent rate. When they just asked, do you believe that we should be shifting police funds to local communities for health care? Which housing? is fine, which is like like with the way that you can phrase it sounds OK. Like, do you want to shift funds around? Like, there are nice ways to phrase it. But like, realistically, I mean, like what happened? A lot of cities post George Floyd did end up reducing their police budgets. Crime rose a ton. And then there became like ubiquitous support for raising those budgets again, which is what happened in a lot of places. Um, I, like, I, I feel like crime is, an, is a problem. Nobody likes crime. Nobody wants it there. People in general would rather have more cops than more crime. I do agree that we need to, we're doing a bad we're bad at like addressing or alleviating the issues that cause crime, like getting people jobs and like, you know, like rebuilding communities and investing in schools. These are things that we're bad at, but I feel like combating it from that end is more important than combating it from the like police end. Like we need to get rid of the cops. Like, yeah, that's, that's an interesting point of view, but the, what, what I would say is because you, you, you criticize like the strategy I have in mm -hmm. terms of shock value, mm -hmm. but that shock value actually works. Because well, it's working it's right now to move minority voters over to the Republican Party. That's what happened in the last election cycle. That's right? because that's because of the Democrat Party, not because of the left. The Democrat Party is in conflict. No, it's because of like like a lot of minorities were uncomfortable. The two biggest like points of contention for messaging around the last set of elections was the all, the socialism stuff and the defund the police stuff. These were like huge I, points I, of contention. I was not seeing the evidence that backed up because there was just a recent poll that shows that Americans is shifting more towards socialism. And I'm not saying it was a by a lot, but you want to know who the largest group that 
support socialism? Black Americans, because our revolutionary leaders have. I this mean, is, but if you if you look at those polls, if we're talking about the same ones, these are polling people that are like under age 26. These are like young, young, young people. It's kind of like how Bernie Sanders would always say like, oh, I'm massively supported by the Hispanic community. And he lost in every demographic except for like college age kids. He had like 80% support. But when it came time to actually vote, one, these people don't vote. And two, they're a, like a much smaller part of the population than, you know, everybody and all together. That's, that's where we differ because I actually don't think we should advocate things based on what is electorally viable. I think we should advocate for things based on what is right. But so, if we can't, we don't get things that are electorally get, viable, then we don't get any policies and then we're just screwed. I know. Let me add this because this is this is another poll that they didn't report on. Because I I admit because we had a lot of work to do mm -hmm. when deep in the police movement started uh, in 2020. It was deeply underwater. 538 showed it was like minus 35 in a nation. And it, even at the time, I'm like, okay, guys, we just got a lot of work to do because the civil rights movement in its heyday was not popular. Like the bus sit-ins had like a 70 percent disapproval rate. So you don't advocate for things based on what, especially from my perspective, what white America tells us to. So ever since we started the defund the police movement and ever since we started messaging, we started to educate people on what it actually means, despite all the propaganda, like the last poll I saw, and it was the exit polls, you had like 55% independents that support the idea, 70% Democrats that support the idea. Now I can really get in the weeds with you because I've co-founded Intended Demands and what our goal in actually defunding the police actually is, abolishing of the police, but that's exactly what, we, like the American people is exactly what we want them. It's a process. And that's why a lot of those cities you mentioned that quote unquote defunded the police, it, they failed because they didn't follow the process. There is a road to abolition, a road to abolition that is very, it is an easy transition. Because people always ask, what, what, what are your guys' plans for this? So once we actually explain that plan and once people actually, oh, it's all about uh, resource management. Like the, so, the same people who are not, they're, they're not confused when it comes uh, to defunding education, but we talk about defunding the police, which like, we spend more on the police than every other country says China does on their military. Like before the Ukraine war, the new, uh, NYPD spent more on their police budget than the Ukrainian military. Like these are things that, like if you're a fiscal conservative, how can you wrap with this stuff? Especially considering, like you said, crime is up. So they are not providing, they are not doing their mandate. And that's all you have to explain to people. How, why we spend this much money when the police is not even solving crime? This one simple question and the fact that people are inherently shifting to the left Despite what you're saying, mm -hmm. if you have 55 percent independents, 74 percent of Democrats, they support our goal, our ask of shifting funding. Then once we do that, then we got another plan after that. But you y'all don't have to know that, because once you decrease uh, the police and you fund the programs that historically been proven to drop crime, once crime drops, as we predict it will. Well, what's the I don't think there are ways to like predict that. That's a really I think there's a few things that like point to small decrease but like what's like the the surefire ways to like reduce crime like what are the surefire finding ways to do that because at, as someone who who do not have this inherent uh bigoted and racist belief that some people are irredeemable mm -hmm. i believe if you provide for people and this has been shown in small scale studies providing housing health care increased wages you know actually a functioning society because we don't live in a functioning society unless you in the like top five percent right so well, we actually I think have, that most people in America are living in a pretty functioning society. No, no. Well, if you if you were like the sixty percent of workers that live in paycheck to paycheck, I don't know when the last time you had to, but that is not that is not easy existence. And I'm speaking as someone who's a member of the proletariat, someone who grew up broke. Who I I literally housed three people in the last two years who otherwise would have mm -hmm. been homeless. Sure, and that, I mean like there are who worked seventy hours a week but he was literally on the verge of being homeless, can't afford a car. What kind of existence is this? Mm -hmm. We live pathetic lives. People literally work 60 hours a week. They come home, they watch Netflix, and they think we live this advanced society. How are we advance? we don't have health care? How are we advance if people can't travel? How are we advance if people don't have family paid maternity leave? That's decolonizing your mind. The things that you guys think make you happy is not, which is why depression rates through the roof, which mm -hmm. is why they subscribe you guys these pills and you guys take these pills like, oh, everything's going okay. I'm, I guess I'm happy now. No, it's just, this society is so broken. It broke your brain. Your brain is so broken that everyone taking depression pills now because our society is junk. Like this is not how we're supposed to live. Now, some people have it lucky. Like I'm, I have it lucky now because as, as a writer, political writer, com political commentator, like I'm lucky. I have, I'm not in this that grind. And, and same as you. But most people can't say that. Most people are uh, drawn factory bots. Now, I do concede this. If you are part of that upper bourgeoisie, you probably have a great life. You get a ton of vacation time. You got a great existence. You enjoy all the great technologies 
and all the benefits America had to offer. But as you see, as time go on, that number is shrinking, 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 shrinking. The wealth income, in the, the wealth income disparity between black and white Americans is worse right now than it was at the height of the civil rights era. We have gone backwards in every sense of the world, word, but people got these new toys. People got this, and all of a sudden they think, oh, this shit is great. But then they ask them questions. Why are you still depressed? They ask them, why are we so depressed? Why are people killing themselves? Why are there so many mass shootings? We do not live it. We live in a completely savage and uncivilized society. And that's just shown by the results on, on the people. Now, I, I just want to say, we got three minutes left. I, I forgot I don't have a problem on Zoom. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we either can wrap up or we can continue. This is your call. Um, I, mean, I think we cover most ground. Do you want to, is there any final things you want to bring up or? Um, <laughs> not much, man. I appreciate, I appreciate the. And my dumb ass. <laughs> Despite that he had like 5,000 people watching his stream, my dumb ass forgot to promote Revolutionary Blackout. <laughs> so that is going to keep me up at night because like, shit, this dude is extremely fucking popular. I think he's still streaming now. He's got like 5,000 people watching him. But easy work. <laughs> like I was, I was literally like in the debate and I see a lot of people say, oh my God, I can't believe um, you were so calm. Like I was calm during that debate. I'm like, I was literally couldn't believe how easy it was. <laughs> but I don't want to talk shit on Destiny. I really don't because big props to him for inviting me on. None of these liberals will ever invite me on for this the reason you just saw. Why do you think you don't see me getting debates with Sam Cedar, for example? Why do you think I'm not I'm not getting debates with people who defend Bernie Sanders in the squad? You guys just seen it. <laughs> Like, there's levels to this shit. There's levels to... And as soon as I start talking to this guy, I'm like, oh, this dude just watched CNN. He subscribed to the New York Times, the Washington Post. And I'm like, bruh, this is about to be easy. And, I, and, and I'm, I would love to see what you guys say in the comments, but I think I did well. And someone said, I'm still waiting for a sign. That debate is exactly why you will never see me, ever. You will never see a sign set that debate. Even though Hassan is the one who called me out. So three and oh, baby. Let, let's say no. Let's let's say the Garland Nixon debate was a no contest. I like that, brother. I like Garland Garland Nixon. So let's say me and Garland Nixon's debate on defund the police was a draw. But what you guys see in the chat? Was this a W for revolutionary blackout? <laughs> was that a W? They they can't. Like when you have someone who is proletariat, when you sorry, proletariat, when you have someone who is a bourgeoisie video game streamer like Destiny, like he he's not connected to the average working day people. And that was clear by what he was saying. I think America, I think most people think we are civilized. No, this is not a civilized society at all. Not a civilized society at all. So I think that was a good dub because I feel good about that debate. Because I already got some destiny people. Like I got. I gained, shit, I got to look at my analytics. Maybe like five, 500 followers already, and, and I haven't checked in like an hour. And that was the point. Like, I wasn't trying to get upset. I didn't want to insult him because I realized that my arguments alone is strong enough to beat him. And I saw some people like, why are you even debating this guy? It has to happen, guys. This dude has 5,000 people watching him. We have, like, this is a big stream for us. We got 500. Like, we need to have these battle of ideas. We need to start dragging people to our side. And sometimes, like, we can be, it can be like an echo chamber here sometimes. Why you guys think I wanted to have one of these debates? I want you guys to see how I would handle, like I have done many times, how I handle people who repeat liberal talking points. People who repeat average, normie, shit lib talking points. Like, oh, I think Joe Manchin and the modern Democrats was... They're just more popular. I'm like, woo, woo. Yeah, I was, um, I was, I was, uh, I was preparing for this. I, I got a few stories that we can cover. Um, unfortunately, CJ, we won't be able to do Nick and CJ today. He, I think CJ is traveling. So I got a few stories I wanted to cover. But before I do that, let's read some chats. I'm going to see what you guys think. I couldn't read the comments 100% because I was playing the video. So let's see what you guys think. Uh, Eagle Wing Turtle. Destiny is used to yelling and pundantry stuff, but he didn't even seem mad at the conversation. 
Like he was learning for himself. <laughs> and that's why I hope I did. I hope I provided another way at looking at politics that not only just Destiny never seen before, but his audience. Like I explained this many times. Think about all the people who are allowed in political discourse. The only black people that are allowed in p- political discourse is the people who graduated from Harvard. <laughs> like the Dr. Cornell Wests, the Brianna Joy Grace, like Destiny, these people, they are not having conversations with black working class Marxists. And he wasn't even prepared for the arguments I was making because he hadn't heard it. He hasn't heard it. He didn't hear. He never heard. I am assuming the criticism of Bernie Sanders and AOC from the left. So he was like, oh, I think progressives are just ineffective because the idea is not popular. No, Bernie Sanders and AOC are are spineless and ineffective politicians. That's why. So when I said that, he wasn't even ready for it. (laughs) Like, whoa, whoa. So I had a good time. You guys see how hype I was. You guys see how hype I was um, after the, this debate. I was I was super excited. And I, I think I'm going to debate someone else here soon, too. We see. I don't know how much of the debate was going to be, but someone reached out to me. He said he saw this debate, and he wanted to take a swing. Go ahead, man. <laughs> Go ahead, man. I hope you uh, – I, I remember this dude. Cause I saw him debate uh, Dr. Richard Wolf. And I, I remember during this debate, it was like the, f- the first time I ever seen Destiny, right? The, in that debate, he was super focused with, like, um, what's the best way to put it? He was holding up the conversation because he was, trying, he was just saying stuff like, define socialism, define this, define that. It was obfuscating, obfuscating, right? He was playing semantics. If you guys haven't seen his debate with Dr. Cornell, not Dr. Cornell West, with Professor Richard Wolf, it was literally him playing semantics. So you got to know it's from the very beginning, since I knew that, I'm like, we're not playing no semantic games. Like, I'm going to tell you the facts, and um, I'm just here to educate your audience, not you. And especially, I had to keep my cool, because I remember I yelled at Voss, and a lot of people, because I yelled at Voss, it was like, oh, Nick is unhinged, man. <laughs> Nick lost his temper against Voss. That means Voss must have won. Meanwhile, Voss was literally arguing for voting for Joe Biden. Voss literally said that we should vote for Joe Biden because of his platform. And I told him, I said, you are a fucking moron if you think Joe Biden is going to do anything on that platform. The entire debate, I crushed him on the logic. But people didn't see it. A lot of people didn't see it that way just because I got upset. I, I got animated, especially as a black man. That's the last thing you want. I know you guys say when I whenever I say this stuff, but I was whenever I yelled at like Vosh, it was like, oh, you're an angry black man. It was like the angry black man syndrome. And then they completely ignored everything I said. And there's a reason why he never talked about that debate because his, his arguments hold up her- horribly. Because he was ar- he was arguing that the left should vote for Joe Biden because that will actually be the lesser evil than Donald Trump. And we all know that's not the fucking case. Joe Biden is funding the border industrial complex more than Trump. So this is why the United States is the unhinged fascist country that, despite what Voss said, there is no lesser two evils. If you vote for the Democrat Party, you are voting for white supremacy. And I can forgive that if it comes from a place of ignorance, but a lot of these people just don't care. They don't care. They don't care that the Democrat Party fund the police more. They don't care that they are uh, complicit in multiple multiple genocides in Afghanistan and Yemen. They're ethnically p- cleansing Palestinians in Israel. So I know there's a lot of white liberals like this, and they just simply don't care. Boss, they simply don't care. But this is the result of people saying that we should vote for Joe Biden. So I learned from that debate with Bosch that it doesn't matter what you say. If you can say the most on point shit, and the guy who was cool, calm, and collected, he can say the stupidest shit ever. And people are like, oh man, he must have did well. That was ha- that's essentially what happened to me and Vosh. So I learned from that, and I'm like, all right, I gotta make sure I don't don't get upset. Make sure I stay cool because if I do that, it's obvious I'm gonna pick his p- points away. So this is who Vosh said is the lesser two evils. Oh shit, wrong shit. I got the wrong receipt. <laughs> oh, let me. Damn, I got so many receipts. I gotta find the uh, my ice receipt. 
I didn't. I posted not too long ago. Fuck, I tweeted that much. Here it is. Here it is. This is the people that Destiny. This is the people that Vosh says is the lesser two evils. And why do people think Trump was super evil? People think Trump was evil because his immigration policy. That is what got him called a racist. You guys know that? That was it. Everything else was like additional from that. His immigration rhetoric is what pulls to separate Trump from Republicans and Democrats. That is the story that Vosh told people. That is the story that Destiny tells people. But this is the reality. And I saw someone comment. Destiny was saying a lot of vague shit. But if you watch this show, if you watch this show, I told you guys, I show you guys receipts like this all the time. As a black poor commentator, I have the onus of proving shit I say. Like Destiny and Vosh, they literally just say shit that is not true. Like it could be like so patently false. But if you're a white streamer and you just say shit with confidence, people will believe you. But that put us at an advantage because that means I come equipped with these debates with knowledge that they don't have because they don't have to work as hard as us. RBN, we have to work hard. Savvy Sabs has to work hard. CJ has to work hard to get credibility. If you are if you are just a confident white guy, you're gonna do well in this in this YouTube and streaming game. So sorry, what anyway? This is who Vosh and Destiny claim is the lesser two evils, right? The Biden administration put forth its 2023 budget, which proposed $97.3 billion for DHS. That's the agency's largest in its two-decade history. Jim Crow Joe. The Custom and Border Protection, part of that, will be the most money it ever received. Um, if you combine the immigration custom enforcement um and everything together, and that would be 26 billion. That 26 billion would be the highest sum ever dedicated to the border in immigration enforcement, significantly more than the 20 billion that the Trump administration started out in 2017. You notice whenever Vosh and Destiny share their political ideology it never includes any of this shit that's why i was telling destiny he was like what what is your plan what is your plan i'm like the first plan is to secure liberation for my people <laughs> like our people were being killed the police are killing three people per day guess who they're killing our water supply is being poisoned the cop is busting our skulls in and if, and, and you got people who are boo yz like destiny and, and Vosh. they will say oh how do you win Motherfucker, it's not about winning. We're in the empire. We're trying to survive. I advocate for mutual aid, community building, community defense, so we can survive. And then as class conscious builds, we can start building strikes. So, sorry, I supposed to be reading comments. I apologize. I apologize. Um, leave some super chats. It helped me weed through some of these comments. There, we got a lot of people watching right now. Um, yeah, Destiny not bad at Vosh. Like, I know Destiny got some cringe-ass opinions. But at least he wanted to have me on and, and wanted to have a conversation. So, And he didn't immediately start insulting people and all this stuff. So it was a legitimate conversation. Yeah, like, bro, Hassan was terrified to debate me, even though he called me out first. And then I ratioed him while I was like, bro, if you got beef with me in Revolutionary Blackout, invite me on your stream and tell me why you got beef with us. And his fans was begging him not to do it. <laughs> they was begging him. Like, he has 1 million followers. At the time, I had 50,000 followers. So he has literally 20 times more followers than I do. But I still ratioed him, simply because so many people wanted to see me have a conversation with Hassan, who many people deem to be the, the leftist, the farthest left on the Overton window. And if Hassan had a conversation with Revolutionary Blackout, we would expose him as the liberal fraud that he is. And he knows that. A lot of these uh, TYT, the majority reports, all these bigger Buwazi channels, they know the presence of RBN exposed their fake progressiveness. Which is why I've been, I couldn't wait for someone to take the bait. And the thing is, he actually 
asked for it. <laughs> Cause he was like, I'm gonna send you the link, bro. I'm like, what's my guy? No idea. You can tell in the debate, he really didn't know who I was. It's just he saw I had a ton of Twitter followers. So thank you for the super chats, guys. We are officially monetized again. Thank God. Thank God. Please support the Patreon too, because I still I'm still not sure YouTube is gonna pay us. YouTube haven't paid us ever since last November. Constant bullshit. So we back monetize. Hopefully we can actually fucking feed ourselves now. <laughs> but let's not rely on YouTube. Please support the Patreon if you enjoyed this debate. If you want Revolutionary Blackout to continue to grow. Because I got this debate with Destiny. Hassan had to resp re respond to me because Revolutionary Blackout is growing. Because I gained like 10,000 followers in like two months on Twitter. So if RBN, if Revolutionary Blackout continues to grow, these people who have to engage with us, they, they're going to have to engage with us or lose the quote-unquote left credibility. Now, I don't even know if that, like, that's not even really a leftist. He even admits that he's a liberal. And I give him props for at least being honest. I get Destiny way more props than Vosh for being honest. Vosh is literally a neoliberal imperialist. His stance is on things like Syria, Ukraine, and foreign policy as a whole. Russia Gate was literally no different than Dick Cheney. This motherfucker is a Dick Cheney Democrat. Like he says he's an anarcho bionist but he's not even fucking that. He's a literally just a Dick Cheney standard Democrat on foreign policy. If you if you listen to George Bush's uh, statement on Ukraine, it's literally the same as Vosh's. And he know I will expose them, which is why they're not doing it. So our debate was a shit show. It was a shit show. Nothing was accomplished in our debate. But I literally reached out. I was like, bro, I shouldn't have got that mad. Let's do a debate that's civil. And he declined. Motherfucker been avoiding me ever since. <laughs> and after that debate with Destiny, I think you guys see why. Uh, thank you for the five bucks. Noah. Uh, you did people proud again. Much love. I'm glad that you guys appreciate the debate. I am not a seasoned debater. Never been on no debate clubs. That's only my third political debate. Um, but if you are armed with knowledge, and I learned from the Voss debate that as long as you're calm, like like I'm black, like you can't be black and yelling at people, man. White people will tune out. I learned that because anyway, I always said it, but. I learned if I was just calm and I pick away, I pick apart his arguments, everything would be okay, right? <laughs> People have been telling me that my whole life. Yeah, just just rewind the stream, Zayden. We allow you to re rewind the stream. So if you just now tune in and you want to hear the debate, literally just start the stream from the beginning, and then you will see the, the debate. Um, I want to see Nick debate black conservative perspective. I don't know who that is. A black conservative, <sighs> god damn, let's do it. That would be fucking hilarious. You know how dumb I would make that motherfucker look. I debated plenty. I, I debated plenty of black conservatives in my life. Obviously, before I had a YouTube channel, it's always funny. I love debating conservatives, especially black conservatives. Are you kidding me? Like debating a Candace Owens. Like you saw how easy that de that Destiny debate was. Imagine I will literally do a debate with Candace Owens and any black conservative in my sleep. <laughs> in my sleep. Um, all right, let's get some more. You guys like super chats really help help me filter. I'm trying to get some comment. I I'm putting some comments I can at least uh like comment on, but any super chats I guarantee to read, and also that help us support the channel if they pay us <laughs> those super chats. Uh Captain Obvious. Vosh equals a Beverly Hills Marxist. The thing is, guys, I am not against class traders. Like, Brianna Joy Gray is a class trader. Dr. Cornell West is a class trader. I'm not against class traders. The problem is, Vosh come from the Beverly Hills. He's a fucking, like, his, his dad is like some sort of fucking government op or some shit. Like, they're all fucking wealthy. But then, despite the fact that he's being he's wealthy, he would attack. He spent all the time attacking tankies. He attacked the North America for all. He attacked forced to vote. He he attacked our general strike summit. 
So I don't, I don't, I don't care if you're rich, if you're a class trader. The problem is people like Vosh, people like Destiny. Well, well, actually more than Vosh. I don't want to throw Destiny in this because I, I haven't seen Destiny attack grassroots activists. But Hassan and Vosh, they are filthy rich, and then they attack, they attack any grassroots activism that they see. They attack the March Mecca fraud, forced to vote, uh, 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 the General Strike Summit. They attacked as well. And the only reason you haven't seen them attack us more is because they know what will happen. I will ask them for a, a debate and they will back down and people, who, their audience, the people who have seen it, will ask themselves, why did they back down from a conversation with this guy that they can obviously beat? So we see, I haven't checked my numbers or anything, but Destiny's a big streamer. I, I just want to, hopefully I can just pull away some of that liberal audience of Destiny. That's why, that's why I hope I did. Uh, Ingles was a class trader. Yep. Um, I think that's obvious when you look at the fact that he he had the foreign policy of Dick Cheney. I am not exaggerating. Find me a foreign policy position that differs. Voss believes U.S. intervention it leads to greater goods. That's Western chauvinism, U.S. imperialism of the highest order. Big shout out to the Bank Sisters, uh, fan, uh, friends of the show. Always got great content because they're posers. Yep. Revolution. I'll, my favorite thing about Revolutionary Blackout is like this. This even though we we're a small channel, man, you can feel the the. You can feel. I can already. Me and CJ were talking about it before. You can already see how much we change discourse among the left, right? And a lot of people that listen to that Destiny debate, they're hearing. Black Marxist arguments they never heard before. <laughs> I promise you that. Uh, thank you for the 499. Brent, I, I'm guaranteed to read you guys' chat if you leave a super chat. I'm still going to read some chats that stand out that I can comment on. But yeah, leaving a super chat is the best way to engage me right now. Um, thank you for the 499, Brent. Any chance we can have an RBN roundtable multi-topic debate to hear where you all peacefully differ? Fun topics and serious stuff. Yeah, revolutionary blackout it's not like a mon like we're not monolith. And that's that's another reason why we wanted to start a black leftist network, a black Marxist network, because we wanted to show you guys that we are not monolithic in the way we think. We have um small we got different takes on some things. Um a lot of our older members we differed a lot on, right? Um, so maybe we can, but CJ, Sabby, Rome, JB, they are base as hell. What am I what am I gonna debate them on? Rome, like we all have, we are, we all are on the Overton window in different areas. Like I, I call myself a Marxist. I sympathize with communism. Uh, Jay not ready to take that step yet. He more, he's just, he more just open. To call, uh, Jay be fine that is. He more open to just call himself a socialist. Uh, CJ just now recently said he's open to call himself a Marxist. So you got to see, there's already differences in the Overton window where we stand. And uh, and everyone in revolutionary blackout out of all of us. Rome is easily to everyone's left. Rome is by far the most left-wing member we have. Rome is the guy who really kind of convinced me to, to become a communist. Uh, back on my old uh, YouTube page, Social CMA, that I haven't uploaded on in like seven months, we used to do streams with, with Rome. And this is before I was like, guys, I don't want to call myself a communist. Um, I don't want to call myself something that I haven't read that much up on. That um, I'm going to just call myself a socialist. But I platform Rome because I'm like, bro, I want to hear from people that are to my left. I want to hear from people who straight up call themselves communists because I didn't call myself a communist like two and a half years ago. And then I'm like, I want to hear you guys. I want to hear the argument. Unlike, unlike some people who just cut the Overton window off to their left, I was like, convince me. And um, Rome made pretty convincing arguments, right? And... uh. The only thing that me and Rome differ on a little bit, because Rome and Shev, like, and it's not even that big of a disagreement, because Rome was like, fuck all electoral politics. The small disagreement is I put, like, 10% focus on electoral politics, which I love Rome for his position. Rome, I love radical motherfuckers, man. But anyway, uh, I still got some stories. Uh, maybe I should uh, get to some of that. I'll read some a few of our, some chats. Yeah, Rome makes, Rome fires people up, man. Rome going to be in Kansas City. We, we having our barbecue mutual aid event. Um, July 10th, 
I should have been announced that. I think I did announce on Nick and CJ. July 10th, if you are in Kansas City, if you're in the Midwest, or if you can travel, Kansas City is where it's at because we're having a barbecue, tour for the poor, mutual aid event. So, yeah, man, that's the future of uh, Revolutionary Blackout is engaging in mutual aid, community building. Like with the Bank Sisters, the Bank Sisters, uh, big shout out to them. They planning Camp Dada, a, a, a direct action. We're going to camp in rich people's homes. My ass might get shot. We're going to be safe. But the future of RBN is literally being, a, we are network. We I will engage in these fun debates just so you guys can see um, how I handle these conversations. Because if you just watch all our shows, it could it can become an echo chamber at times. So I have this debate with Destiny just so you guys can see how I will handle people who disagree with me. Yep. Uh KCMO, KC Kansas, same thing. I li- I literally live on the state line. Like I'm on I live on the Missouri side, but I literally drive two minutes. I'm in Kansas. So Woo, man, they're not ready for that. So Vosh people was upset at me because I didn't we did not have a civil debate. It was literally us yelling at each other. It wasn't a coherent argument. If you if Vosh fans thought I was fucking unhinged, which I was, I do admit I was kind of unhinged. Like looking back at it as a now that I'm more of a seasoned political commentator, I should have chilled, man. <laughs> like I could have won way more people over. And that that debate did help me. That's why Vosh and them stopped debating me. Cause that's when I first started. I debated Voss, and all of a sudden I had 2,000 subscribers on YouTube. So, uh, and I could have did much better if I just fucking chilled. And I learned that. And hopefully through this debate with Destiny, you guys see my growth as a commentator. Because if you guys see my video just from two years ago, it was pretty fucking trash. <laughs> yeah, that was some people say. Some people always criticize me. They say, oh, man, you lost your shit at Voss. Like, motherfucker, you were disrespectful. <laughs> he was disrespectful. So that's why. But I'm I'm running too much. I should get into some stories. Uh, let me read uh, this super chat. Lefties need to look into systemism. There's a lot to learn and how to actually design and implement implement revolutionary processes. Well said, my friend. So I'm gonna take just a one minute break. One minute break. Just so I can use the restroom. Let me use the restroom, guys, and I'll be right back. And we're gonna cover a few more stories. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just play some random part of the debate. While I take this quick break, and I'll be back, guys. That quote unquote defunding the police, it, they failed because they didn't follow the. I see police disappear from their communities because they don't want their kids doing crack or being in gang violence, you know, or like Brown. Wait, not true. So there was exit polling, and, and I don't blame you for this because there's been so much propaganda. Because after the George Floyd protest, the establishment was terrified. So on MSNBC, you see people say stuff like, oh, my God, defund the police is only supported by white people. This is white liberals going too far. But from the very beginning, and this is from 538, and they and the mainstream media never reported on this. I can I can send you the, the link to this if you want. Mm-hmm. They polled people on how they believe in defund the police. And that number had, had a lot of work to do when they polled it because it was mostly, um, oh, shit. We only got 10 minutes left. I don't got pro on my Zoom. Oh, but they okay. found that even when defund the police was at its most unpopular, it was supported by black people at around the 60% rate when they just asked, do you believe that we should be shifting police funds to local communities for healthcare? For which housing? is fine, which is like, like with the way that you can phrase it sounds okay. Like, do you want to shift funds around? Like, there are nice ways to phrase it, but like, realistically. All right, I'll just play that so you guys have something to listen to. So I did want to cover... Oh shit, let's see. Which one I wanna do first? Which one I wanna do first? Um I do this one. I think I got time for two stories, maybe. Maybe I had to make it quick. Um all right, let's start this segment. So I explained before on this show, and I explained to Destiny that the Democratic Party is the party of the police state. We live in a police state. So what people think happens in China, Russia, whatever they would consider, I don't even know what they would consider a police state. He, uh, Destiny used Russia as like a fascist state. So it was like, if you think Russia have a police state, if you think any other country have a police state, and you think that is what defines them as fascist, you must 
concede that we are a fascist country. You must concede that, right? And you have both parties, including the Democrat Party, after pretending to support George Floyd and Black Lives Matter, they are now funding the police even more. They are planning to uh, fund the police more. And why are they doing this? They are doing this because this is late-stage capitalism. As things continue to get worse, as we got a baby formula shortage, hunger is increasing, more people are going homeless, you need police to maintain order. Because their job is not to protect you, your, their job is not to serve you, their job is to uh, protect capital. That's their job. And whenever I have any conversation with people wondering, like, I can't believe he he saying that we shouldn't vote for Democrat or Republican. I am like, critical race theory explains that individual racism, while problematic, the more important thing to tackle is systematic racism. So Lil Billy, who's a racist because he don't like black people, while that is frustrating, the biggest challenge that black people have is the institutional racist system. So if you understand that, if you claim to understand critical race theory, how can you say you're anti-racist when you vote for the, the Democratic Party that is actively funding the police more? Not only that, they mocked and insulted the black community in a way I have never seen anyone done. Like Republicans and Trump wish they can get away with disrespecting black people the way that Joe Biden did when he invited George Floyd to the White House. The Democratic Party invited George Floyd to the White House. And then after they invited him to the White House, they proceeded to fund the police more. They, pretend, they proceeded to double down on the police state. How is that not worse than what any of what the Republicans do? Because at least the Republicans will straight up tell you where they stand. The Democrats use black pain and they use black suffering to enrich themselves. And then they turn around and fund that system even more. How is that not the most anti-black shit you can do? And this is what I'm trying to raise awareness about. We need to separate ourselves from the Democratic Party. So not only that, i seen, and I'm still shocked at this. So Amy Klobuchar, who literally lives in the state and who is responsible for not prosecuting Derek Chauvin, this cost her the vice president slot. Because there's no doubt in my mind, Amy Klobuchar was going to be the vice president. Because why? How, how else will Biden get her to drop out of the race when Amy Klobuchar was literally doing better than Biden before, before Super Tuesday? He got more. She got. She did better in Iowa, New Hampshire. I don't remember Nevada, but I think she did better than. Yeah, he, yeah, she definitely did better than Biden in Nevada because Biden ended in like fifth place. So the only way that they could have convinced Amy Klobuchar to drop out was to offer the vice president slide, which I am 100% uh, convinced that was the case. But because of the George Floyd protests, and it was revealed that Amy Klobuchar uh, let Derek Chauvin off, and she had historically always been a police state defender. I'm going to show you guys the receipts. I don't have it saved, but you guys know I, always, I show nothing but receipts on the show. You guys know, other than Bob Menendez, Amy Klobuchar is the second highest funded senator by the police. Do you guys know that? While, while people are pretending, while white liberals like Destiny and Vosh pretend that racism is a Republican Party uh, problem, Democratic senators literally take more money from the police than the Republicans do. And Amy Klobuchar is the second highest funded senator with the police. And number one is Bob Melendez, two Democrats. So the Democrat Party is the party of the police state. Now, with that, now that I said all that stuff, look at what Amy Klobuchar and the Democratic Party is doing. This is this is so gross. Like, if you're black and you vote for this party after this, I have words with you because you're hurting us. And I'm gonna show you guys. I'm going to show you guys the argument I made 
um, that's flames, that b- the black liberals in the black community that continue to prop these people up, give these people the political cover and power they need to screw us over. So look at the date that she says this. 576 officers lost their lives in the line of duty in 2021. Pause. Pause. Where'd she get that number from? You guys know? I know. I know. Bro, out of those 500 police officers that died, like 400 of them died because of COVID. You you guys know that, right? Do you guys know that suicide is, like, police suicides, like, they hit record numbers in 2021. They broke the record for police suicides. Keep the pressure on them. That's all I'm going to say. Just keep the pressure on them. So this is disinformation by Amy Klobuchar. Amy Klobuchar is spreading disinformation. And then she says, we passed a Senate resolution designating this week as National Police Week to honor the officers who put their lives on the line every day. Every They put their lives on the line. You know, police officers are not even ranked in the top 10 dangerous professions. <laughs> I don't know the list on top of my head. But I think like construction worker, all this stuff. Yeah, see, I, every, like she got racial pretty bad for this. But Amy Klobuchar is repeating the line of the Democratic Party. Here's the, my man Gritty, always with the receipts. In 2006, Amy Klobuchar prosecuted and imprisoned a black teen named Mayan Burrell for mur- murder, despite there being inadequate evidence and a witness saying that he was not there. But white liberals, tell me more. I would love to hear it. I would love to hear you guys explain to me how white supremacy is a Republican Party problem. I would love to hear you guys explain to me how white supremacy is a Tucker Carlson problem with Amy Klobuchar, Kamala Harris, and many of the Democrat senators and mayors who pledge to fund the police more. They continue to victimize our community by siding with the police state. Just like this, what I say earlier. These are the same people that say, oh, we believe in critical race theory. Critical race theory must be taught. The Democratic Party is the party of critical race theory. Meanwhile, they don't even believe in it. So how is this not the most frustrating thing if you're black to have people like Amy Klobuchar destroy our community? I may have to put myself back on the screen. Whoops. Oh, well. Let's see. Wonder if someone had a receipt of um, because I know A1 would get in their ass. Here's here's another good one. My my mutuals on Twitter always got a lot of good stuff stuff to say. Um, at least 1,124 people were killed by the police in 2021, according to an online database. And there was only 15 days last year where police didn't kill anyone. Oh boy. But people still believe the Democratic Party is the party that is fighting white supremacy. They they want us to focus on Tucker Carlson instead of their party that is funding the mechanisms of white supremacy. Here's another headline. No progress since George Floyd. U.S. police killing three people a day. This article came out a month ago. (laughs) <laughs> and add Joe Biden pushes to fund the police more. And then they say, oh, crime is going up. Okay, you guys are funding them more, and they're not stopping crime. The only thing they're doing is killing us, our brothers, our sisters, our aunt, our nieces, and even the people who are not killed. If you're a class conscious, there's regressive fines and fees that destroys the working class, a.k.a. the black and Latino working class. Via civil asset forfeiture, regressive fines and fees like the over policing of tickets, different court fees, lawyer fees. This is class war on behalf of the rich. And you want to know what's most disgusting? Oh shit! <laughs> let me. I'll pull. I'll, I'll, let me find my receipt again. Oh Jesus! 
Oh, Jesus. All right. This is what another one of my mutuals here pointed out. Guess what week they decide to do this? So Amy Klobuchar and the Democratic Party is designating this week National Police Week. The same week that George Floyd was killed by the police. Dear Heavenly Father, I have no more patience for any black people who vote for this party. I am daring you guys to name me more, something that Republicans did that are more disrespectful than this. So not only did Joe Biden invite George Floyd's family into the White House and then fund the police more, on the week of George Floyd's killing, they are making a national police week. I should follow this guy. Infuriating. Infu I don't know. I don't even know what else to say. That's it's just infuriating. Like you got you gotta know why they're doing this, right? George Floyd is a still a very recent memory. Two years is not a long time. Two years is not a long time, especially considering how I many police. I mean, people are going to get killed in the next 20 years or so. They are doing this to overshadow George Floyd. I know that's all crazy for us right now, but imagine 10 to 15 years from now, they're celebrating National Police Week. They're celebrating National Police Week instead of celebrating George Floyd. So you, you do you guys really believe 52 weeks out of the year is an accident that the Democratic Party chose the week that George Floyd was killed to make National Police Week, history is written by the victors. I would not be surprised in 20 years, most young people who don't know who George Floyd is, like a lot of Gen Z people probably don't know who Rodney King is. In 10 years, all the only thing people are going to be talking about is, oh, National Police Week. We don't get platformed. You think... The mainstream going to be listening to black Marxists? No. And now this is the last thing I want to add to the story. And then we almost at 90 minutes, right? I, if you listen to my debate with uh, Destiny, because that was the main conversation, right? He mentioned that the reason why the progressive left is losing is because their ideas wasn't popular. You guys saw how quickly I shut that down. Right. The reason why the left continue to lose is because we have been sold out by Bernie Sanders and AOC. There's no other way to say it. So them being incompetent, they're not knowing how to use their leverage. That is what create moderate victories. But that is but the lack of victories from Bernie and AOC. A lot of people misunderstand the lack of victories is not why I criticize them. I criticize Bernie and LC for joining the establishment on the most crucial issues by like sending $40 billion to Ukraine, like coordinating their, coordinating their votes to fund the Capitol Police more. Do you guys think that was a one-off thing of Bernie Sanders and the squad funding the police more? They doubled down on this. This coming from Jacob Ben, of all people. And you see how they're still optimistic? Progressives need to resist the, dem the domestic war on terror. Spoiler alert, Jacob Ben, they are not. They are not doing that. And I'm going to show you guys exactly what I mean. So you had this new domestic terrorism bill that is being, here it is, the, the Domestic Terrorism Prevention Act of 2022. It sells through the House on a strict, party line vote. Not a single Democrat. Only one Republican. But not a single Democrat, including the squad, including Bernie Sanders, is voting against the Domestic Terrorism Prevention Act, which, to me, sounds like the, the new Patriot Act. They just got the Patriot Act 2.0. 2.0. 
Twitter is also going to start banning people who are anti-war. They release a new disinformation policy program that we need to start paying attention to. But how many times did I explain on this show that white America, this white supremacist, fascist country that we live in, they pretend that they are going to fight white supremacy. They're, they're going to fight terrorism because they're doing this under the guise of stopping January 6th, stopping mass shootings. But what do you guys think the increase of the DHS, the Justice Department, the FBI, the police, they're being funded more because of the, the Domestic Terrorism Act and they're getting more domestic spying powers and mandates. Who, who do you guys think they're going to turn this on? They're going to use this to go after black people, workers, and the left. But once again, the squad sold us out. I explained to Destiny, the left isn't about, and there's a lot of people who mis misunderstand what the fuck the left is supposed to be about, what socialism is supposed to be about. We are fighting for liberation of disenfranchised communities. There are a lot of white bourgeoisie leftists like Vosh who believe that leftism is all about protecting white suburbia. You guys getting white suburbia getting health care, having their student loans canceled. Those are bonuses of a left movement. The left movement that originated from the struggles that our brothers and sisters in the global south have faced, the socialists and Marxists that support the civil rights movement, the, the, the left is a movement of liberation. It is not just bourgeoisie politics <laughs> where save the suburbs. That is literally the policies of AOC and Bernie Sanders. They don't give a fuck about poor people. They don't give a fuck about black people. They don't give a fuck about brown people. They just advocate for shit that will help the white suburbs. But when it comes to actually preventing state violence on our people, they join the side of the oppressor. Over and over and over again. But people are still confused. Well, not, not most people. Because I think most real leftists and activists and organizers, they're done with Bernie and AOC. So what? let me say this like this. The boutique left, the Sam Cedars, these people, they are so comfortable. And they don't actually care about black people and brown people. That's why they can't possibly understand why we will criticize Bernie and AOC despite their rhetoric. So. I think that's I think that wrapped that segment up. Um I don't have no time for this next story, but I think the next story I'm gonna do on our next my next live stream. Um we're gonna go over Chris Hedges new article. Actually, let me read this because I think this is a great we're gonna dive into the whole article next time. Tomorrow we have Outsiders View, Nick and Josana. Um make sure you guys check us out. She got Josana's killing the game. I, I'm so proud of the work that Josana is doing. Um, but since the topic of the debate between Destiny and myself was about, is the U.S. a fascist country? Is U.S. a moral good? I'm going to end this stream with this. This is a passage from Chris Edges. Chris Edges. Chris Hedges' recent article. I'm going to just read it. I think it's powerful enough literally just to read and wrap the stream up with. This is from Chris Oracle's, Chris Hedges' recent article. The United States, as, an, as a near unanimous vote to provide nearly $40 billion in aid to Ukraine, illustrates, it's trapped in a death spiral of unchecked militarism, is, which is, according to the 14 uh, characteristics of fascism, part of fascism is unchecked militarism. Abandoning the people so you can have a strong, robust, national security state and empire. That is what fascism is. And this is what Chris Hedges is explaining, Destiny. Maybe you should read more Chris Hedges. Stop listening to liberals, right? He said there's no high-speed trains, no universal health care, no viable COVID relief programs, no respite from an 8.3% inflation. Nothing. No no UBI, no payments to people, nothing to alleviate this. No infrastructure programs to repair a decaying roads and bridges, which require $41 billion. 
You know the amount that we just sent to Ukraine? There are 46, sorry, 43,586 uh, structurally deficient bridges. And they average 68 years old. If only Americans will see how beautiful China is. If Americans only see what the industrialized, civilized world actually look like, you wouldn't have people even trying to debate me on stupid shit like what is fascism. <laughs> Are you serious? No forgiveness of $1.7 trillion in student debt. No addressing income inequality. No program to feed 17 million children who go to bed each night hungry. No rational gun control or curbing of epidemic of nihilistic violence in mass shootings. Uh, I don't agree with this last sentence, but you guys see what Chris Hedges is getting at. I don't think we should have... I'm not a big gun control person. Like, especially in the black community. If, white people, if you want to dis disarm yourselves, go ahead. Not us. Uh, no help for the 100,000 Americans who die each year of drug overdoses. No minimum wage of $15 an hour to count a 44 wage of years of wage stagnations. No respite from gas prices that are projected to hit six a gallon. I already seen it as high as like seven bucks in California. And this is why I explain this is what a failed state looks like. I will argue this is what a fascist state looks like. So with that said, we have reached the end of today's program. But we have a lot of great brother and sister channels. Make sure you subscribe to JB Font and Savvy Sabs. I think Savvy is live now. I went a little bit over, but Savvy Savage is going to be live on her channel. Make sure you, you guys watch that. And if you guys want to support the show, if you guys want to support the network so we can get more big debates like uh, Destiny and shift this over to window, because as we get bigger, these people are not going to be able to ignore us, guys. They won't be able to ignore us. So please help us grow by sharing, liking, and supporting us on Patreon. So we can, we're going to have this amazing mutual aid community based barbecue uh, July 10th. So any support that we can get as a network allows us to grow so we can do on the ground reporting. Like you guys see what stuff people like status Coup. Oh, all right. So Savvy is a little bit. All right. At least I feel better now. I usually don't like live stream at the same time as my comrades do. So Savvy will be live later tonight. So make sure you guys, we still got another RBN affiliated show tonight. So check out the Savvy Sav channel. Uh, I'll be live with Josana tomorrow. Um, I hope you guys enjoy. Please like and share. And um, leave W's in the chat. W's in the chat. Tweet about it. Social CMA, deliver Destiny a dub. Even in, a lot of his fans are saying that. So uh, this was a fun stream. Hope you guys enjoyed. Have a good one, fam.